This evening, we will continue on our dynamic lessons on finance with a specific focus on T-bars and the relevance of land as it pertains to capital and in particular as that capital relates to the African family as well as the global indigenous community. Notwithstanding, before I begin today's lecture, I would like to address one or two questions that may have arisen from the last lecture. It will not be the case that every week I address questions from the previous week, notwithstanding, insofar as last week was our first lesson, then I will take the time to address the questions as it came. For those of you who were not able to participate in last week's lesson, I can only encourage you to watch it online as it is currently available online. And so without further ado, please let us begin. And as usual, I will have the same difficulties as it comes to this thing called screen sharing. Let's get that correct. There we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, sir. Thank you kindly. And let us begin. Last week, we looked at the fundamental law of commerce. And we indicated that the Law of commerce has three fundamental governing points. The first of which is the agreed exchange of value for value. The second of which is that once the barter trade is completed, legal ownership switches from one person to the next. And the third of which is to uphold the first and the second laws. We also stated that failure to properly understand and apply this law creates imbalances of trade and a false legitimization of stolen wealth from indigenous people in Africa and the Americas. In following our lecture last week, a question was raised on the platform and I would like to address the question as in some ways it, it does have some important relevance and needs to be addressed. The first part of the question reads as such. It says the whole premise of what Chief Timothy stated in regard to the rightful ownership of the African gold neglects to take into account the fact that the right of extraction of whatever mineral wealth was granted by each respective African country's governments of the day. Hence, to vilify any foreign power for having common sense to extract these minerals is simply wrong. And of course, what was being referred to in that observation or comment, if you will, is the reference that we made to our discussion on the gold of the, on the Guinea gold coin, which of course was minted <clears throat> in the Royal Mint of Great Britain from 1663 to 1814 under the auspices of Sir Isaac Newton. Just as a matter of historical clarification, one should know that by 1663, Many of the great African kings, and indeed as this was West Africa, the Akan kings had already been captured and sold into enslavement. Indeed, the first people to be captured were the soldiers of Africa, the strong men, and the kings whom they served. It was in many realms only the very elderly and the sick who were left behind. 
Thus, any suggestion that Britain had been granted extraction rights for African gold is not only a perversion of the truth, but also belongs to the historical misrepresentation that seeks to hide the fact of having stolen the gold in the first place. Contrary to the idea of creating villains, and contrary to the aspiration of creating heroes, the true mastery of finance requires that we mute our ears to contrive meta narratives and fairy tales. The law of commerce is completely blind to offices and titles or the justifications of politics and religion. It looks at the historical record of bartering, buying and selling, and like the scales of justice, it weighs the equal trade of value for value, irrespective of the person or the authority in the transaction, dispassionately placing all on the same scale, both small and great and rich and poor and free and bond and living and dead, so that at the end of the audit, the book of account is accurate. In this regard, the law of commerce demands a balanced account. As far as this applies to the guinea gold coin, it remains the case that no time did a valid exchange of value for value occur. Thus, consequently, Sir Isaac Newton did receive stolen gold from the merchants, and that gold was then minted and circulated throughout the public with the king's image and the seal of the royal mint. Is he a villain or a evil person? Well, that's not really the point. What we are concerned about is the fact that his financial books are falsely balanced and remain so to this very day. The second point, or rather question that is raised, reads as follows. He asks, the other thing I would question is the implied contextual statement that of the first law of commerce, agreed exchange of value for equal value as how much something is worth depends upon where you stand at that time, i.e. how much should a thirsty man pay for a bottle of water in the desert in my local supermarket. I understand the question that is being asked and I understand the nuances that he wants to bring forth in that question. And of course, the statement itself reminds me in many ways of the biblical story of Esau and Jacob, as this is a mixed group in our classroom today with people coming from very diverse backgrounds. I won't suppose that everybody knows that biblical narrative, so allow me please to digress a moment and explain. Esau and Jacob were non-identical twin brothers. Esau was born first and as such received all the rights granted to the firstborn. To make a very long story short, Esau goes hunting in the wild for days and weeks, and when he comes back, he is completely famished. His brother Jacob had just made a pot of lentil stew and Esau asks for a bowl because otherwise he says he would die of hunger. And then Jacob says he will sell him the bowl of lentil soup in exchange for, note this, his birthright. Now, the birthright obviously comprises of 
their father's lands, the beasts that are on the lands, the social titles that his father had, etc. And of course, anyways, because Esau is on the verge of dropping to death from his hunger, he agrees to give away his birthright. Now, within the biblical account, one tries to convince us that the moral of the story is that Esau somehow dishonored his birthright by selling it for a bowl of lentil stew. But the fact of the matter is this, Jacob, his brother, is a deceiver. And when he eventually takes the birthright blessing from their father, he demonstrates his adeptness as both a deceiver and a liar. At no time is a bowl of lentil soup a fair value for value exchange for one's birthright. This is what we call theft by deception. Jacob, who later became, of course, old man Israel and very noble as such, had his beginnings as a deceiver and a thief when it comes to the law of commerce. Now, coming back to the inquiry of our student, how much should a thirsty man pay for a bottle of water in the desert in his local supermarket? The answer is quite simple. Let us suppose that a bottle of water in Saudi Arabia costs 2.6 Saudi rials, while a bottle of water in Dubai costs 2.19 dirham, and a bottle of water in Egypt costs 5.10 Egyptian pounds. I have no idea where the person who wrote the comment resides and which desert is close to his supermarket. But in any case, anybody going into his local supermarket to buy water should expect to pay the agreed local market price for a bottle of water. In a commercial transaction with market established prices, the thirst of a single customer is not part of the price calculation. Unless, of course, <laughs> the water is free for people who are not thirsty. If you find yourself charging people more money for water because they are thirsty, or charging people more money for food because they are hungry, then it stands to reason that this particular financial masterclass was inspired by merchants just like yourself. No offense intended. And I took this opportunity as a quintessential learning moment because where there is misunderstanding, we must bring forth understanding, especially when it relates to finance and commerce. We said in our lecture last week that capital is wealth and that it is expressed in both material form as well as representational instruments, not to mention human knowledge-based capital. In today's lesson and for the duration of the time that we have, we will take the time to consider the importance of land and its relation to capital. The ability of our people to successfully work the soil of the earth, indeed the ability of any people to successfully work the soil of the earth and process its resources over multiple generations is the root source of all capital and savings. Indeed, capital is born in the land. 
while every farmer and miner understands the truth of that statement. It is often lost to those who dwell in the city. Our earliest form of commerce was based upon the trade of agricultural goods, which are derived from working the land. For example, in exchange for tomatoes, wheat for barley, oil for wine, for our purposes in this course, the importance is not so much the commodity, but rather its place of origin and harvest, which is the soil of the earth. Whether we are classic agricultural farmers or modern day architects making high rise buildings, the land and its yield is the first source of capital. The knowledge of how to transform various rocks and minerals into productive units is a treasure unto itself that is passed from one generation to the next. And today we productively use that knowledge to build high rise buildings, cars, airplanes, jewelries, and every trapping of our society. But all of these great things have their origin in the land, which is from where we both harness and store our wealth of savings. Let us consider the forests of Europe and the so-called jungles of Africa. In the same way a farmer knows how much crop grows in an acreage of land, every good forester knows how many trees are in his forest. This is not because he spends his days counting trees per se, but rather because he or his father or his grandfather planted the trees themselves, thereby knowing every tree that is growing and every tree that has been cut down. Man has used trees for productive capital since the beginning of time. And those communities that don't have trees that can be used productively are forced to engage in commerce with those who do. Some trees are harvested after only 50 years, some after 300 years, and other trees are only harvested after a thousand years. Indeed, the ability to protect old growth trees over multiple generations is fundamental to capital savings. Consequently, there is no such thing as a jungle. The forests of Africa and Brazil are amongst the greatest capital savings in the world and must be diligently protected from thieves who would steal that which they did not sow. Our ancient African kingdoms have planted forests for baobab, mahogany, cedars, ebony, and other old growth trees as part of their capital savings. When Solomon was building his temple, he didn't simply request wood to make a temple. He wanted cedars specifically from Lebanon because it attested to the quality of the wood. Trees represent a cumulative wealth over generations. And once harvested, they must be replanted with every new generation. 
That's why there is no such thing as a jungle. Kings keep inventory of their forests in the exact same way they keep inventory of any other capital savings. In modern accounting, a T account is used to keep track of inventory. T accounts are visual representations of individual accounts and are used to show all additions to the account, which are called debits, and all subtractions to the account, which are called credits. The debits go on the left-hand side, while the credits go on the right-hand side. Of course, this gets a little bit more complex, but for the time being, let us just work with that fundamental starting point. If we look at our ebony trees account, we see that 300 ebony trees were harvested for capital production, while 500 new trees were planted. Considering that the ideal growth period for ebony trees is 250 years or more, the planting of 500 new trees is a capital investment into future generations. I want to make that statement again. The planting of 500 new trees is a capital investment into future generations. Thus, to understand how T accounts work in this particular context, combined with intergenerational financial planning, perhaps let us consider the accounts of who I like to call our young Prince Adwa. Now, young Prince Adwa is being groomed for kingship. As such, he must learn everything about his people, everything about his lands, everything about the economy, everything about the neighboring nations, everything about finance, so that by the time he ascends to the throne, all things are known to him. And of course, as part of his royal training, young Prince Adwa must learn about forestry. He must learn how the various families of the wild cohabitate, and he keeps record of their populations. And of course, he learns about the trees of the forest, which are be, to be protected for 50 years, the trees of the forest, which are to be protected for 300 years, and the trees of the forest, which are to be protected for 1,000 years. During his exploration of the forest, he reviews the accounting for ebony trees during his grandfather's reign which lasted 70 years. And that accounting was what we looked at a moment ago. We see that 300 ebony trees are credited to the account, which is to say that 300 trees have been sold and 500 trees are debited to the account, which is to say that 500 trees have been planted. At a price of $1 million per tree, the sale of 300 ebony trees is a great revenue to the kingdom, for which the value is debited to the treasury account. The 500 trees that were planted cost the treasury $2.5 million and the value is credited to the treasury account. By these records, the young prince is able to know exactly 
how his grandfather managed the productivity of the ebony trees during the last 70 years. He is also able to use the record to see if any of the trees have been stolen. The success of intergenerational land wealth requires the sustainable reproduction of forests. What often looks like a jungle to foreign eyes is actually a well-planted forest in which every tree is numbered and fully accounted for over many, many generations. This wealth is part of the capital savings of a people. This is why it is often said that a land and its people are one. And the wealth of every people is their land. Once we know the value of our capital savings, then we can properly use our knowledge to put trees and rocks into productive applications. This chateau in southwest France sells for 1.9 million euro. It is presented as a emblem of wealth and prestige, economic prowess, and good social standing. But the fact of the matter is, in the context of land and capital wealth, its economic value represents that of two African ebony trees. Only through proper financial management, as well as protection of our trees and lands, will the images of wealth and prosperity begin to change. This has been the way since the beginning of recorded history and is not bound to change anytime soon. When some people speak about the writing of our ancient ancestors. They say it is too monotonous, especially the hieroglyphs, because it records the number of cattle and the agricultural produce, the trees and the fruits. They also record the royal dynasties during which these things were planted and groomed. Traditional African financial accounting began over 6,000 years ago. The record is there in plain sight for all to see and learn from and integrate into our economies today. The king's record wouldn't just be written in a book. It would be written in stone and murals would be painted on the tomb walls as part of the record for the next generation. Because land and knowledge of how to work it productively is the source of all capital wealth and savings by which peoples and nations interact. This is truly the core of finance. There is no greater wealth than the land of a people. Organized crime syndicates put great effort into devising creative schemes for the theft of lands, and then create even more creative schemes in a structured effort to hide their theft. 
the two primary ways of stealing land are to either murder the rightful owners or to displace the rightful owners. However, neither types of theft constitute a legal change of ownership under the law of commerce. Because land is the wealth of a people and the responsibility of its productivity management is intergenerational, the brazen theft of lands constitutes a intergenerational dispute that does not and cannot simply go away until it has been legitimately addressed in the books of account. The greatest organized land thefts, of course, in history were conspired during the last 500 years. And the legitimate settlement of the disputes have not been adequately addressed to this very day. There is a old saying that money is the root of all evil. Well, I personally do not agree with that sentiment. What I can say is that it certainly can be a source of temptation. The importance of land as the primary source of capital wealth is so tempting that in 1452 and again in 1493, the Vatican issued papal bulls encouraging European Catholic kings such as Spain and Portugal to take illegal possession of the lands and people throughout the Americas and Africa. In the Americas, they tried strategy number one which was to subdue and murder the rightful landowners. Indeed, it is conservatively estimated that more than 55 million indigenous Americans were murdered during the theft of land in the Americas. Thus, on the one hand, and I'll say this clearly, places such as Canada, the USA, and Australia stand as great beacons of democracy, internationalization, commercial development, intercultural engagements. However, indigenous people to this very day in those countries still demand a just transaction a legal settlement as required by the law of commerce. They do not say that the nations and the people have to leave the lands. And I don't think that that makes sense in any way whatsoever. But they do say that there has been no legal and just transfer of title. And consequently, those nations can claim no legitimate sovereignty over the lands. For the indigenous peoples, there has been no legitimate transfer of sovereignty. The American Declaration of Independence in 1776 was ultimately a conflict between a British king and his subjects. The fact that the subjects or citizens, if you will, of Great Britain no longer wanted to pay taxes to their king, and so they declared independence from him, or they divorced themselves from him, well, that has absolutely nothing to do with the indigenous population. And from the perspective of trade, from the perspective of finance, and from the perspective of commerce, the information is completely irrelevant. 
We are dealing with money. Who cares about declarations if the bill is not paid? First, you pay the bill. Then you make your declarations. Otherwise, you remain a thief and a vagabond on the land of others. We said at the beginning that the law of commerce is blind to offices and titles, politics and religion. This book sitting next to the scales of trade, next to the ancient balance of commerce may look like the Bible to many of you. And indeed, if you desire to become a true master of finance, then this book should be your Bible. But in fact, it is a ledger. On the left side, it records additions, which we called debits. And on the right side, it records subtractions, which we called credits. All which have been legitimately conducted through the equal trade of value for value. Nothing enters the book, the ledger, that has not been transacted with an equal trade of value for value. If you are doing your certified financial analyst course, the first thing you will learn is to understand the moral obligations, the social obligations that an accountant has. That is true whether you're managing a small business. It is true whether you are sitting at the head of government. And it is true if you are sitting at the head of a region managing inter-regional trade and relations. As it relates to land, the management of land is a multi-generational enterprise. For the indigenous people of the Americas, there are no entries in this particular book for their lands. And the same is the case for the indigenous people of the Caribbean and Australia and Africa. Those people who account theft of lands and the resources therein as a positive position, as a debit, have misunderstood the fundamental principles of commerce. If they are debiting those lands, they have misunderstood the fundamental principles of finance. If they are debiting those lands, they have misunderstood the fundamental principles of trade. And consequently, their books constitute no legitimate record of account whatsoever. It doesn't really matter who's keeping the books. Books can be written, but at all times, we must be prepared to conduct an audit of the books. At all times, when we see an error in the books, we must be prepared to say, from an intergenerational perspective, your books are not correct. And these statements are as true today as they were 500 years ago. And consequently, as the international community comes closer together to achieve our UN sustainable developmental goals, 
as the community comes closer together to address the issues of climate change, as the community works more closely together to find solutions to poverty, to malnourishment, and to all the challenges that are facing Africa, Europe, Asia, the Americas, and the world, we must at all times be prepared to take a honest, pragmatic approach to our books. And when the books are false, one shouldn't stand as a braggart and boast about the wealth that they have falsely acquired. From an intergenerational perspective, the false books must be rectified. While we are talking about the challenges of climate change and everybody is looking for solutions to finance and address these issues, Europe has very ambitious plans for how to decrease their global carbon emissions. But where will the resources come from? Europe has no resources. So they are completely dependent on Africa's resources. That means if we are going to meaningfully engage with Europe, if we are going to meaningfully engage with Asia, if we are going to meaningfully engage with the Americas, and indeed, if we are going to meaningfully engage with the world, then it means that we must begin to take account of our capital wealth. And that first accounting begins with the land. The land belongs to the people. The land belongs to the nation. And a nation that doesn't know anymore what is inside of its land, the value of its trees, the value of its earth, and the productive capacity of that earth, the value of its rocks, the value of its minerals, and the productive capacity of those rocks and minerals, a nation that doesn't know this value, a nation that hasn't accounted for this value, will simply accept the false statements that are made by organizations and institutions that are obviously trying to acquire that wealth. And so in this financial masterclass, we go back to the fundamentals. And those fundamentals are intergenerational. We're not afraid to look back in the past so that we can make projections into the future. In order to have a proper accounting, we must be able to take records and project 50 years and 100 years into the future. And when someone comes, let me say it very clearly, when our trade partners come to our lands and want to engage in trades, before they talk about how poor Africa is, before they talk about shithole countries in the Caribbean, they should know that from an intergenerational perspective, they stand before us deeply indebted. From an accounting perspective, they stand before us, I won't say as beggars and vagabonds, but with credit lines that are of ill repute. 
And so the books need to be reset. Our people need to pay close attention to what is on the left side of the book and the values that are on the right side of the books. And we must be prepared to engage in a comprehensive audit of lands, of buildings, of peoples, and of all topics belonging to capital wealth. This week, we discussed land and we discussed tea barns in accounting. Land is capital wealth and tea barns as the rules by which all sober accountings make their decisions. And in that spirit and in that note, we conclude our lesson for this evening. I bid you all a wonderful good night. Do we have any questions before we sign out? Please. Thank you and blessings to you all. Good night. Chief. Yes. Hello, Chief. Yes. I was trying to raise my hand. You know, this technology is not in our favor sometimes. Okay. My name is Tolani from Soweto, right? Yes. yes. First, before I make a, a, before I raise the question, I want to actually commend you guys for the beautiful work you are doing. Africa has never met any revolutionary a, a, a movement as big as yours. And we, we actually want to help in any possible way we can. You know? So thank you for the beautiful lesson. Now, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I've, I've seen what you guys are trying to do and I've seen how, how the African people are so not ready for actually what you guys are coming up with, you know? So in, in my efforts to actually try and advance uh, uh, this mission that you guys are pulling, I'm, I'm, I'm actually seeing possibilities of making sure that uh, where I'm at, my country becomes the first uh, 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 partners to assist you and demonstrate what you guys are, are trying to do practically, you know? So I've been able to combine a group of uh, spaza shop owners, the local retailers. I've been able to combine a group of farmers and the only party that is missing now, I'm, I'm, I was able to actually uh, rope in a guy that can do uh, processing and manufacturing so that we create an ecosystem so that each and everybody that has registered on Lumi can be able to buy in that market. And the spaza shop people can also benefit from that market, including the farmers. So now the question I have is how far are you guys willing to actually partner with that initiative? Because I've seen that you have a you have actually assisted some of the countries with big plantations. And ours is just a little assistance with machinery that can actually process milli meal and process other other food other food or, or, or needs so that that ecosystem is completed. I would ask you to please let us correspond further on the topic okay. formally and in writing. Obviously, it's very interesting for me and I, yes. I applaud you for your, your great efforts. Um, but I would ask you to please put your email address in the chat group. Okay. And, and then let us correspond directly on that. And thank you once again for your great work. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. He Hello, Chief. Greetings. 
I see King Charles. Please, yes. How are you? Wonderful. I'm Mr. Thanks. Charles here from Tanzania. Greetings. My name is Charles Andrea, but I call myself King Charles because I needed to appreciate our ancestors, Africans, what is they needed to us. That's why we are existing right now. But my question is, uh, you talked about the future. Of course, right now, we are existing in the future. There is no future at all. We are living in the future. Why? Because when you read some books about our readers, especially first president, they're talking about the future. Since we got independence, we are talking about 50 years from now. 50 years back, at, up to 60 years back. For example, Tanzania, we are celebrating. I'm from Tanzania. Tanzania, we are celebrating 60 years since we got independence. But uh, since we got independence until today, Africa, we are living in borders, which was created by, by people from during the, 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 the during the Berlin conference, I can call Berlin bandit conference. We don't have one currency like what uh, Kanari Muhammad Gaddafi, the late president of Libya, he did. So you came with the Lumi digital currency, please. There is no, there is any agreement for African countries to accept Lumi digital currency and when they are going to to, 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 to allow and announce to their citizen. Thank you very much for your your question as well as your statement. Um, to address the first part of what you said, I'll be very clear on this. When it comes to the future or the past or the present for that matter, as a intergenerationalist, we make no distinction. That which happened yesterday may as well happen this morning. And those works which we are preparing for tomorrow is actually the works that we are doing right now. We live in the present and all things are interconnected, past, present, and future. So when we talk about anything that's supposed to happen a hundred years from now, it could only be as a consequence of those things that we are doing right now. Otherwise it will not and could not manifest. And so I, I appreciate your statement, all of our realities are in the present. When people are hungry, they are hungry today. When people need shelter, they need shelter today. And so when we seek to transform our great continent, we seek to do so today. All things are in the present and the present speaks to the past and the future. As it relates to the engagement of Lumi across our continent and the unequivocal integration by the governments. We have been doing phenomenal works on the ground. And as I said, by the end of this year, we hope to make some important statements, but I would not necessarily utilize this platform and this discussion for making those statements. So I, I ask for your patience and understanding. We are in the beginning of the second year of one of the greatest economic transformations, not only in African history, but in the history of mankind, what we're doing is quite phenomenal. And so we must be patient with ourselves as we develop our own momentum. And as we, like any newborn on the block, learn to walk steadily with two feet. Let us be patient. Thank you. I see a hand up 
by a Slam DR and a series of numbers thereafter. Yes. Can, can you hear me, Matif? I hear you fine. Welcome. Uh, uh, you're speaking to, I am uh, Apostle Dr. I am Apostle Professor Hawk Makepula from South Africa. Uh, I just want to compliment and congratulate you uh, because God chose you uh, to lead this uh, 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 this continent. Uh, uh, Lumi is there to stay, uh, is there to change lives. God is going to use this resource of Lumi and is using you and we are praying and interceding for you. You must know that uh, 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 God, he said we must seek his kingdom and his righteousness first, then everything we want will be added unto us. Now God is using you for that answer. And uh, the world is not expecting, and they will be shocked sooner. And it's, it's not even sooner now, it's coming to be soonest. I just want to mention something uh, that we have said in your statement, that you've said uh, people that are saying money is evil and all that stuff, uh, I want to say money is the answer of everything but the love of money is the root of all evil you must not love money but, but the money is the needy so uh, uh, I just wanted to comment on that point uh, thank, you, uh, thank you man thank you for that point and indeed I, I affirm that statement completely I've always insisted that yeah. in terms of the Lumi it is a tool. As a currency, it is a tool that we must use to achieve our developmental objectives and our financial security. Oh, definitely so. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you. I see a hand up by Mr. Levina Kid. Welcome. Yes. Uh, greetings, His Royal Highness. I'm Levina. Uh, from South Africa. I don't have a question, but a suggestion. In these classes, I perceive you as a great, brilliant farmer who is able to see when the rain is going to rain. And you are then coming to the community letting them know that there is a rain coming. Therefore, we have to prepare our soil. As we are attending these classes, you are preparing our soil, our mental soil, so that at the end of the day, we can be able to use our seeds, our stimulus wisely so that we can get good results, profitable results, meaning that we have to use our stimulus, not recklessly, but we have to use it wisely. So with that being said, my question is that, or suggestion is that with this, there's a lot of work to be done in this soil. There's a lot of work to be done and we have not covered a lot. So, I wanted to know that is it not possible that we can work twice a week? Perhaps have these classes on the on Wednesday and Thursday. Is it possible that for that to happen? Because really this rain is coming. I can also smell it in the eye in the in the, in the air that the rain is just around the corner. Thank you. Lavena, thank you very much for the commentary. You know, I, I appreciate what you stated. And with regards to a seminar twice a week, there are certain farmers, I, I know many of them, especially my, my family and my brothers in Jamaica, they like to go out to their garden, not only once a week, but they will be out there on a daily Bases. And they like to, if they're growing herbs, they like to just touch their herbs and smell their herbs. If they're growing tomatoes or yams, they just want to check up on it. But the fact of the matter is, 
At the moment, we are working many gardens. And in order to achieve the integration that we aspire to achieve, my time is extremely, and I, I, I know everybody is busy, but I give no exaggeration when I, when I say my time is extremely limited. And I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to engage with you even this one time a week. And as soon as opportunity permits for us to meet twice a week, then I would have no reservations about that. But at the moment, it's not possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I see the hand of Dumile Mabuye. Um, I would like also to say something, if I get a, a chance to. Uh, you can. Um, this is Dumile. Yeah. Please, thank you, Dumile. Go ahead, yes. Um, yes, thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be speaking to you. Blessings. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to be clear. Um, if you're saying, well, basically two points. I'd like to hear if you're clear, if you are, if you are speaking to the future as far as uh, keeping account with any trade that is happening. So, so everything that uh, has been stolen, are you saying that uh, we need to, we need for it to be accounted for before we can carry on to? to the future to start now trading in the new assets um, in the new trade markets that will be coming up in the future. Um, I hope that question is clear. And uh, number two, uh, I'm not sure if it's as obvious as I, I think it is, but I think it's a question that needs to be answered. Um, I would say now, having seen how they stole everything to begin with, um, they, they did it in savage ways. Uh, I presume everyone might agree with that because uh, blood was shed. So I'm asking now, um, since that blood was shed, is, how do we fight the future now as far as uh, making sure that uh, they don't get to do that again? Uh, I don't know if my question is clear. Yeah, because, uh, for, the, for the two questions, Dumile, I would let me first address the first one. The fact of the matter is that we are in present time, which I call real time. And consequently, all of the opportunities that are before us within the market, we must take advantage of them. And at the same time, as we build our wealth and our wealth is building rapidly, we must not lose sight of the full dynamics of our wealth. So yes, we have some accountants who are responsible for addressing issues of the past. And by the past, I would make a simple analogy. I'll make a, a not even analogy, a simple matter of fact. If I travel to Paris and I enter the Louvre and I see the remains of my ancestors and the monuments of my ancestors, then of course, we must begin to take account of that. We couldn't suppose that those monuments belong to somebody called a king of France or a president of France or a people of France. And the same is true for those which sit in Britain. The same is true for those monuments that sit in America. And the same is true for any of our ancestral monuments that sit anywhere outside of our continent. We must give account for that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we must acknowledge the opportunities that are on the table and take advantage of it. Coming to your second question, and I want to make this abundantly clear, we are not engaging and preparing for war. We are preparing for leadership. We are taking the time to look at all the things that have happened in the past. And we are preparing ourselves to see mistakes and call them as mistakes. So that as the global African family rises on the international stage, we don't duplicate those mistakes and we don't allow others to duplicate those mistakes. And that is only achieved 
by talking openly and transparently about the injustice, injustices that have transpired and are transpiring so that when we communicate and make plans, we do so wisely. Note what I said earlier, all the world is talking about preparing for climate action and how they have to transform their economies into economies of sustainability. In order for them to achieve that, that must be done through strategic partnerships with the global African family. There's no getting around that reality. So we prepare ourselves for partnerships and we prepare ourselves for leadership. And we look at war as a legacy, an unfortunate atrocity of the past for which we will not cease to speak about because we honor our ancestors and we know what happened in the past. And at the same time, we prepare ourselves for a transformative history, a history in which the fathers and mothers of all humanity are not afraid to lead. We can look to our European cousins, to our cousin Charles and our cousin Elizabeth on their thrones, and we could tell them quite candidly, you made mistakes, rectify your mistakes. Mm. We can look to the papacy in Rome and we could tell him quite directly, you made mistakes, repent. Those are not words of war. If anything, those are words of love. And we must expand the minds of all people so that they could understand that in owning up to the errors they've made in the past, that is part of growth and development and human social interaction. Thank you. So do, you do you think the-, the Mr. Odell Whitham, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for my uh, time um, I had. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to, to have the uh, uh, speaking time with you. Um, you can hear from my accent is different than what you are, what you are used to because I, I live in Western Europe. I live in Belgium, so I grew up in the Netherlands and I know how um, European uh, think. I was born in uh, South America in Guyana, uh, so and I I, I follow different um, um, yeah uh, Pan African groups and uh, and development um, yeah issues. But uh, I, I heard you mention uh, something about uh, the climate uh, will change and we have a big problem and stuff. And, and that is something very interesting because uh, everybody is talking about that. And um, when you look into to the, to the science, the practical science, you will see there was nothing wrong with the climate. Yeah? You had the ice age, uh, thousands of years ago, you could even prove that. You could prove that the climate is going cycles. And so, but there, we, we just follow the Western indoctrination, the Western science, medical science, environmental science, they, are, they come to Africa and then they will wait. Let me give me, please give me two minutes more. They two will minutes. Go to Africa <laughs> and then they will go to a river and say, yeah, this is the Victoria River. So we invent that, you know? So, what I'm saying is that there's only solution for Africa to move forward, apart from our own, own currency, we have to identify who is an African. Yes, and, and, and um, why are we there? You know, it's not that the Europeans came and discovered Africa. Africa was there before, you had civilizations before. You could look at the pyramids in, uh, in Egypt, but you could also look at, uh, in Timbuktu, uh, yes. Uh, in Mali, you could look at uh, different locations. In Zanzibar, they had ancient civilizations. What we ourselves, black people, should discover ourselves. We don't have to wait until the white person to come and say, "Yes, uh, your history is like that. This and this happened. You came from a monkey, and yeah, and you don't know. You you don't know much. You don't. You're less than us. You're, and actually, you're a Homo erectus. No, we should stop listening to West Western science, Western indoctrination, Western religion." Odell, and, do you and, have a question? Another thing, Satanic SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030. We have 17 goals. I think I suggest, really suggest you to take a time and um, study those 17 goals. And what you will find out is very shocking. 
That th those goals are designed to, to, to stop the development of African nations and developing nations. Because sustainable, that means sustained, that means stay the same. So they don't want Africa to rise up because, and, and, and to make innovation, to change. No, what they want is to get green technology, windmills and solar panels. Where would they be fabricated? In Europe and in China. There's where they're gonna make the, the, the money. They, they have the labor. They will, they will, so, and they will use those raw materials from Africa. No, I would say we should, we should reject the Sustainable Development Goals agenda immediately. Kick out those NGOs who come with actually like they're philanthropists, they're coming with false profits while they have a, a totally different agenda. There's no climate problems. What people could do is adapt to the, to the changing climate. Every day the climate changes. Yes? We adapt, the Dutch Thank people you. adapt, yeah. they make canals, they make dikes, you know, the, the, the sea level, they, they say the sea level would rise since 30 years ago, they say it would rise two, three centimeters, wow, 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 wow. 20, 30 years later, nothing happened. The sea level did not rise. There's no polar bears that would be extinct in the, in the Northern hemisphere. Everything turned out to be a lie. So what Africa should do is wake up, Yes, and uh, we talk about the African currency. The last, this is the last point, one minute more left, sorry for the, my long introduction. Um, one, uh, one currency, we should, I really, really agree with that. We should do that, but I don't think uh, this uh, cryptocurrency is the only solution. We should have a hard currency with paper money, but without the debt, without the debt, okay? So um, uh, just, uh, um, we should make, let me say, the paper money should actually be based on our value of our minerals. So uh, determine how much minerals we have. We can make paper money according to those minerals, right? And then uh, that, that could be our bill of exchange. We don't need- uh, Odell, your... thank you very much, Odell. Yes. Thank you very much, Odell. I hope, I hope, I hope you. That, uh, could at least come into one of those points that I just make, at least one of those points. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Odell. Yes. If I comment at all, let me, say quite candidly with regards to your first comment and climate change and the idea that it is a myth. I suspect that anybody sitting in the Caribbean listening to this discussion would desperately beg to disagree with you. The fact of the matter is they're not at all interested in the science because they are confronted with the reality, they're confronted with the reality of losing, for example, in Jamaica, parts of the beaches, which have seen hurricanes coming in. That's no problem. Sea levels, Odell, please, thank you. Sea levels rising and of course not subsiding again. And of course, while there is cyclicality as it relates to our planet, the discussion for climate change is recognizing that over the course of the last 80 years, what man has done through his industrialization process. And, and let's be very clear about this. What the Europeans did that and the thank Americans- you, Odell. Thank you, Odell. Thank you, Odell. Yes, sir. What, thank you. What Europeans have done, if that appeases you, is accelerate the speed with which those carbon emissions enter our atmosphere. So a cycle that may have taken perhaps a, another 8,000 years to reach the point in which it is at now has been accelerated. And that is what is trying to be addressed. I thank you very much for your comments. And I see the hand of Mr. Kyobi Jiro. Yes, Chief. Greetings. Greetings to you. I'm Jerome from Uganda, Kampala, East Africa. I appreciate, uh, but uh, my query is, Uganda is not yet well versed with the, our currency, Rumi. Uh, what I can say, uh, probably I'm the one, I'm the representative of Uganda, uh, as far as African Kingdom Rumi is concerned. I'm trying to I'm trying to explain to my people about Rumi, but they are not catching up. I don't know, Chief, how am I going to be helped 
to see that at least Ugandan is yet to know what is all about Rumi currency. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you very much for your commenter. And indeed, Uganda are ancient lands of Nubia are, is extremely, extremely important as are all of our nations. The fact of the matter is we've engaged in a program that has global implications. It yes, impacts yes. the entire continent. In fact, it impacts the continent so much that we almost can no longer afford to speak about individual countries. We are in a yes, time of the African continental free trade area and our objective going forward and at present must be to consolidate, to consolidate our continent, to consolidate our peoples, to consolidate our economy. And the efforts that will advance Lumi within Uganda are the same yeah. efforts that will advance Lumi within all African nations. At the end of the day, the key, and, and maybe this picks up on some of the comments that Odell was making earlier, of yes. our activity going forward is of course African industrialization. It implies yeah. having a framework in place where we are committed to a non-apologetic -apolog manufacture of goods for our own consumption. And if the international community requires our resources, then they should receive our resources as finished goods, goods that have been made and manufactured in Africa by Africans. And so the journey, as I said earlier, and as it relates to its implications for Uganda, is remembering that we are at the very beginning. This is not the end, this is the very beginning. In fact, it is so early in the beginning that we are almost like a, a embryo, if you will. You know, we, we're on our feet, but uh, we are, we're, we're still very young and we must be patient with this journey. And we must, with that patience, exhibit the character and tenacity that is required to achieve what we have to achieve. And in that spirit, I thank you, Jerome, for your commentary from Uganda. I thank you all for your questions. And I thank you all for participating. Wait, one second, please. Listen. I'm glad thank the conversation goes to you. All. And a wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Good uh, night. Can I have one second before you leave? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything about the, the industrialization, industrialization. We need to industrialize, yes, but uh, it cannot be achieved when you have, when you follow the sustainable development goals. You cannot um, uh, uh, industrialize when you have solar panels and windmills with uh, unstable energy supply system. So that can cannot go hand in hand. So that's what I'm saying. The sustainable development goals agenda 2030 was invented to stop the development, the industrialization. Odell, thank you very much for your, your observation, Odell. I wasn't actually looking to engage in a debate or an extensive conversation. Please look into it, please look into From it. From the perspective of African industrialization, if you feel uncomfortable with the technology that is coming from, whether it be Europe. I'm an electrical engineer. Odell, please, please, Odell, please. I know what I'm talking about. Odell, whether it be Europe or whether it be the Americas or whether it be Asia, then the framework going forward through African industrialization is obviously to recognize and engage our great brains and our great minds and have our researchers and our developers develop solutions that work for us. And that's why we have our own currency and that's why we have our own economic mandate going forward. And so consequently, it's not about criticizing what other people are doing in their space with their technologies. It is about how we are applying our wisdom and our knowledge to build technologies that could bring us forward. Thank you, one and all. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Blessings, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Chief. Good night.